Congressman Jake Ockerkloss is our guest here on OTR this morning. It's been an eventful first term for the Democrat from the 4th District from January 6th to the crisis in Ukraine. He's been an outspoken member of the delegation, and now he must navigate the midterms. The Congressman is here. Let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR. I'm Ed Harding along with New Center 5's political reporter Janet Woods. Great to have you with us this morning, and we're pleased to have Congressman Jake Ockerclaus in the House with us this morning. He represents the state's 4th Congressional District, which stretches from Brookline to the South Coast. He's a Democrat, he's a Marine, and he holds degrees from Harvard and MIT. Congressman, thanks for your time. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me Thanks on. for coming in. So as we are talking right now, um, how optimistic are you that Putin will retreat because of the pressure from just economic sanctions itself, if not anything else? I can't step inside the mind of Vladimir Putin. What I can say is that we're going to make this war a nightmare for him. He has miscalculated both the degree of isolation that Russia would face because of this unprovoked, unjust war, and he's also miscalculated the will of the Ukrainian people to fight. Uh, just earlier this week, I was meeting with a member of parliament from Ukraine who is in Washington, D.C. now, and she was relaying to us stories of heroism and of combat on the streets of Ukraine from citizens, through members of parliament, through the president uh, himself. Vladimir Putin is going to face an ongoing worsening insurgency in Ukraine, and the Russian economy is going to be undermined both by the financial sanctions as well as the technical import sanctions. Um, we hear a lot of stories about how they've had the stock market closed for numerous days. Yes. Um, there's a lot of complaints from the oligarchs there. But do you get a sense that these reports are real or they're just filtering over to our side to make us feel more comfortable that things are going in the right direction? I think it's helpful to think about the effects on Russia in the short to the long term. In the long term, there's no question that the technical sanctions that we've levied on them are going to be devastating to their military industrial complex, to the maritime industry, et cetera. The financial sanctions that we've levied on them are going to be detrimental in the short term. The ruble has cratered. Uh, Average Russian citizens can't access the full uh, amount of their bank deposits. The Russian central bank has been frozen. And so Vladimir Putin is facing both a tough short-term scenario for confidence in the economy, mm -hmm. but also a worsening mm -hmm. long-term outlook. However, despite these body blows, he hasn't yet been punched in the face. Mm -hmm. And the time has come for him to get squarely punched in the face. We used to have a saying in the Marine Corps, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. What is that punch in the face? It's energy sanctions. We've got to cut off the oil. And do you think that uh, President Biden is close to doing that? I think that Congress is increasingly putting the pressure on the Biden administration to do that. Uh, last week, I advocated quite uh, assertively that we cut off oil, coal, and natural gas in consultation with OPEC and our EU allies. We're now seeing bipartisan movement on that in the Senate. We've seen Speaker of the House Pelosi come out in favor of those sanctions. I think it's time for the administration, again, in concert with the EU, to move on these sanctions. So, so, so let's talk about uh, President Biden. Do you, at, do, do you at all, and fault is my word, but do you at all fault the president for, for not supplying Ukraine earlier, uh, for not maybe accelerating if it could be, and I understand it's complicated, Ukraine into NATO, giving Ukraine the weapons and the artillery needed for this, what would appear to be a long expected invasion? We have provided Ukraine with significant materiel, uh, more than a billion dollars worth of lethal aid and non-lethal aid. We're going to continue to provide Ukraine with significant support, up to $10 billion more. And for any Republicans who are questioning this president's commitment to the Ukrainian cause, I would put forward two things. One, imagine Donald Trump in the White House these last two weeks. It would be a nightmare for NATO and for the free world. And number two, this president over the last three months has used intelligence in concert with diplomacy to isolate the Russian president and to rally the free world to the cause of Ukraine. I think it's been an impressive display of leadership of the free but, world. But the line is at troops, right? No troops, no American forces go in there. We are going to defend every square inch of NATO territory. We're going to honor our Article 5 commitments. Ukraine is not part of NATO. A sidebar, but uh, part of the conversation that we're having here right now about Russia and, and uh, about Putin. A uh, Ukrainian-born billionaire, now a British and U.S. citizen with deep ties to Russian businesses, politicians, and oligarchs, has contributed thousands of dollars to your campaign since you started running in 2019. Do you know how you know him and his wife, and will you continue to accept donations from them in light of all that's happening right now? Well, I've taken uh, contributions from American citizens who uh, support uh, my election or my re-election and have no ties whatsoever to the Kremlin. I think you just look at my <laughs> voting record and you look at my vociferous advocacy uh, in the face of this assault on Ukraine. This, this strikes me as, as sort of uh, grasping at straws from 
uh, would-be opponents trying to muddy the track record that I've, I've built. And you're confident that Leonard Blavnik has no connections whatsoever to Russia, despite all his businesses and his contacts with oligarchs and uh, different uh, different well, political uh, contacts in R Russia? We should not be getting into the scenario that we got into during World War II, where we take somebody's citizenry and their ancestry and say that because somebody may have uh, ties or ethnicity that is associated with an enemy of America that they too are enemies of the United States. That's but not how we his, act as a but country. But most of his businesses are in Russia and they are deeply embedded in Russia. That doesn't bother you. That's, it's okay. I, I, again, I think if you look at my voting record and my track record of, of uh, advocacy on this issue, it's just unquestionable where I stand. This, again, strikes me as really uh, would-be opponents trying to create a distraction when what we need to be doing is rallying bipartisan support mm -hmm. for energy sanctions against would, Russia. Would you return any money that you had received uh, from him? If there's any evidence that, that there are people who are supporting the Kremlin right now, I, would, of course, would not take any contributions. That is not the case. How do you know these, um, him and his wife, Emily? I, I have a broad base of support. I can't give you the track record of every relationship uh, I, I have off the top of my head. What I can say is, um, you know, we take, we take contributions from people who are, uh, want to see people who are um, uh, trying to build a, a more fair economy that's working for everybody and that want to see the gavel in Speaker Pelosi's hands or another Democrat's hands in January 2025 when we're facing potentially another contested election result. Let, let's talk about the January 6th committee. It has filed its report, and not surprisingly, it concluded that Donald Trump did engage in a criminal conspiracy to defraud the United States. But the question to you is, what happens now? Because there's little chance that the Senate would pass it, even if it gets through the House. We are seeing that the January 6th committee is laying a fact pattern to... Uh, put forward a 14th Amendment resolution that says that Donald Trump, uh, because he incited insurrection against the federal government at a time when he was a constitutional officer, is not able to stand for election again. I think that would be an appropriate mm -hmm. next step. Mm -hmm. um, the president's still talking about wanting to raise corporate taxes in light of inflation and everything that's going on. Do you think this is the right time to push that forward? Yes. I think that people making more than $400,000 a year and corporations that have been able to evade uh, taxes over the last 25 years need to pay more so that we can provide three and four year olds with pre-kindergarten so that we can lower health care costs so that we can make clean energy investments that are going to help us transition to a fully sustainable economy and divorce us from any energy uh, reliance on Russia. And no worries about how what effect this could have on ongoing inflation. When we look at well, for taxes, you mean? Yes. Well, taxes actually would be deflationary in the sense that they are taking But, I money. mean, more money going into the economy for spending for all these different uh, things that you just listed. When we look at, at the, the core domestic priorities of the president, these are things that expand the productive capacity of the economy. We're talking about uh, workforce development initiatives. Uh, we're talking about um, expanding our health care force so that we can provide more fair and effective health care. These are things that pr expand our productive capacity and are thereby deflationary in the medium to long term.